we have the privilege of having the chairman of the special committee for Canadian unity and have named none other than Mr. Keith Anderson. Mr. Mr. Anderson, how do you do? Very well. How about you, Ricardo? Excellent. Okay. Really excellent. I like to hear Especially that. Especially the fact that we're talking about a subject that uh, I believe many people in this country have at heart. Could you tell me a little bit about the, the, Canadian, the Canadian Special Committee for the Unity of Canada? Sure. The Special Committee for Canadian Unity was founded in 1994, so it's almost 20 years old now. And it was founded by uh, the constitutional lawyer and professor at McGill, his name is Stephen Scott. And this was in the middle of Jacques Parizeau's attempt to take Quebec out of Canada. Uh, Professor Scott looked at the project for the law and he said this is not only illegal, it's revolutionary. And we need to have the federal government step in and refer this to the courts and make sure that we have the Supreme Court of Canada telling the Quebec government exactly how illegal this project is. Unfortunately, though, Scott and others wrote to Jean Chrétien, who was the Prime Minister of the day, he didn't pay any attention. He said, no, this is not a legal matter, it's a political matter, we have the letter. And uh, he proceeded to allow this referendum to take place in 1995. Now, understand, this was the second one. This was the second referendum that took place without any legal framework at all around it. I don't know how many advanced democracies permit this kind of thing, but it was an outrage, absolutely an outrage, that we had no legal framework to conduct this referendum. And of course, Parizeau and the rest of the separatists felt, well, we can do what we like. Uh, if we win, 50% plus one, goodbye Charlie Brown, Canada's finished. Why would Mr. Cretin do anything? I don't understand why he refused to act. Uh, he thought, perhaps wrongly, that, oh, we're going to win, so it doesn't matter. Trudeau felt the same way. So I don't blame just Chrétien. We have to blame Pierre Trudeau for this, too. Because he felt, oh, in 1980, we're going to win, no problem, except, <laughs> what about the third time or the fourth time? They didn't ask that question. They should have. In the, second, in the case of 1995, it was so close that eventually, Chrétien realized it took a lot of pressure uh, and the Special Committee for Canadian Unity was involved in that pressure. Remember, I want to add this because it's an important part of the history. The only committee that argued in favor of a legal approach to separation during the 1995 referendum was the Special Committee for Canadian Unity. It was an actual referendum committee that had a platform which it wished to advance. And what the special committees wanted to say during the 1995 referendum was 50% plus one wasn't enough. Uh, there had to be a constitutional amendment uh, to our own constitution to make all of this legal. And by the way, Mr. Parizeau and separatists, the borders will be on the table to negotiate because Quebec will not leave Canada with its current borders. That's what we wanted to argue. The special committee demanded the right to make those arguments during the 1995 referendum campaign and the no committee, those are our Federalist allies, refused to give us our freedom of speech and would not allow us to argue those arguments. It's a great democratic country. Yes. Now, now, Ricardo, I love Canada. You love Canada. But this is one of the great untold stories of our history, that the very arguments, now remember what happened. Chrétien referred this to the Supreme Court after the, the, he almost lost. Uh, we saw how ashen and shaken the man was as Prime Minister almost to lose our country. That was enough, I think, to galvanize him, plus the fact that 2,000 people showed up at McGill's uh, law faculty, uh, uh, a big public meeting with the Special Committee for Canadian Unity held. He saw that. Jean Chrétien did, he realized that Montrealers and good Federalist Canadians were not happy with the federal government's silence doing nothing. He finally did what he should have done before the referendum. He referred the whole matter to the Supreme Court in a reference case, very important reference case. It took two, almost three years before the Supreme Court uh, came down with its decision in 1998 
and it said exactly what the Special Committee for Canadian Unity wanted to argue during the referendum campaign, and which the Federalist No Side prevented us from arguing. Now, which would have been? The, the, what we wanted to say to the population of Quebec in a referendum campaign, where else do you need to say these things? We wanted to say 50% plus one is not enough to make such an important decision. If they had 50 plus 1, he, that means like in a year down the road, I could come back, if, let's say Quebec separate, I could come back and say, look, I want another referendum, I want to uh, return, and I want to be part of Canada again. Of course. Uh, uh, this, it's crazy to do such an important decision based on a, a hairline victory. It just doesn't make any sense. So, though we wanted to argue that. We were prevented. We wanted to argue that borders would be renegotiated. That is part of the Clarity Act now, by the way. That's, you know, to his credit, Chrétien came late to the game, but he put that in. Uh, and we wanted to argue that you can't do this without amending the Constitution of Canada, which sounds, well, you know, it's just, that's just some legal, legal stuff. No, no, what that means is all Canadians have a say and whether this is done or not done. That's what it means if we accept that argument. I will come back to it. The Special Committee for Canadian Unity wanted to argue those things during the referendum campaign and was prevented, illegally by the way. This went in front of the courts. Also not very well known. The Special Committee for Canadian Unity argued its right to freedom of expression in front of the courts and the no side was found in violation of our right to freedom of expression. And who was in charge of the no side? Daniel Johnson. The, the, so as it, he would prevent you from having freedom of speech? Yes. And he was, it was determined by the courts that this took place. Now, if we had had our, you know, we should have been really smart, and we should have said, okay, we're going to ask for damages. We didn't. I mean, that's, you know, we weren't in it for money. I heard, with my own ears, that the people that were promoting the campaign for the no wanted to win with just one percent so that the rest of Canada would be at the knees of Quebec. Hmm. Did you ever hear about that? I, I hadn't heard that argument. Yeah. Uh, you know, with, uh, <laughs> listen, there, there are weird and wonderful things that go on in politics. So I won't, I'm not going to say, oh, that's impossible. There, there are some weird things and it's that happen. That you know very, very well. I won't mention name today. We'll discuss it at a further yeah. date. But um, it, it, it happened right here, upstairs, the discussion, yeah. with one of the top organizers of the federal liberal at the time. Anyway. Well, let, let, no, you asked the question. It's a very important one. I don't want to go into the history too much, but it's, I want to bring it up to present day. The Special Committee for Canadian Unity um, also was behind, helped, because Stephen Scott, who founded the organization, is one of the premier constitutional lawyers in Canada. And when, when the Clarity Act was passed, finally Jean Chrétien and Stéphane Dion, they realized, okay, <laughs> we've got to, we can't let another referendum happen, a third one, without a legal framework. So they, they passed a legal framework for them, it's called the Clarity Act. It, it's uh, from the year 2000. And of course, as members of the Special Committee, we were very, very happy that that was done. And it included all the things we wanted to argue in the referendum campaign. So of course, we'd be happy with such a law. I want to point out to you that Jean Chrétien, when he initially didn't want to do any of this, after it was adopted, he says that that is the most important thing of his legacy. That's what he's most proud of today, of, of his whole prime ministership, is the Clarity Act. So go figure. Uh, I think the special committee had a little bit to do with making sure the federal government was moved in that direction. But what did the Quebec government do? They immediately passed what I like to call the Anti-Clarity Act. They said, we don't care what you say. We don't care about your Supreme Court and what they, they reference, or your Clarity Act. Quebec has the right to determine its own future all by itself and we don't need constitutional amendments and uh, we don't need, all we need is 50% plus one. We hold the referendum on our terms, we decide the question and if we decide to leave, we leave. 
That's their law. That's in effect what it said. And it stayed on the books from 2000 up until the present day. Now, the Special Committee for Canadian Unity, I myself as a citizen, with the help of Stephen Scott, challenged that law. We brought it in front of the courts and we said, look, this is illegal. This, no, the referendum, what they were planning to do in 1995 was illegal. But this thing that you have passed, it was a separatist law, this is illegal. This, you cannot do this. You cannot say these things. It is not law in Canada for you to behave this way. And it's been in front of the courts for 13 years. Why 13 years? Where's the law? Because the government, the government, which says it wanted, the Quebec government now says, oh, we wanted to have this all settled. They didn't. They spent years arguing that I, as a citizen of Quebec, I had no business making such arguments. It wasn't for me. I had no standing, no right to argue these things. And we had to spend, Stephen Scott again, Brent Tyler, lawyers working pro bono, had to spend years in front of the courts arguing that I indeed did have the right as a citizen to challenge the government and to say, look, you're not allowed to do this. That took years. Then they delayed and their lawyers were sick and this and that. Finally, finally, after 13 years, it's in front of the courts. And I have to add, because I'm, of course, very proud of the history of the special committee, as I'm sure you can tell, um, the federal government just three weeks ago intervened and they joined the case, which has taken them many years to do. And they basically said, uh, if you want us to, to leave Canada, you have to have a constitutional amendment to do that. And I repeat, that sounds very legal and very boring and very silly, but it isn't. Because what it means is that everybody else in Canada is, has to have a say in whatever is negotiated. Yeah, they're part of the family. They're part of the family. The Quebec government says, no, we do things here in Quebec all by ourselves. C'est à nous à décider. And the federal government is arguing, no, the constitutional amendment process has to be respected. And that means that Alberta, BC, Prince Edward Island, they're all going to have a say. Why? A strong federalist like Thomas Mulcair would support the fact that with 50% plus one, Quebec could separate. I, I think he's just doing politics, Ricardo. Uh, we know he, the majority of his seats come from Quebec. They are nationalists. Some of them, I believe, they don't say so, but are closer to being separatists than they are to being good Canadians. I would make that argument. Some of them were former members of separatist parties who say they maybe have changed, but maybe they haven't. And so he's currying favor, he's courting separatists and nationalists. And if the Quebec government says, and they passed this you know, two, two or three weeks ago after the federal government intervened, all the parties in the assembly got together and they said, you are such bad people, Ottawa. You have no say in this matter. And they all agreed. All these provincial parties agreed. Can you imagine? They all agree that Canada has no say in Canadian law. It's the most ridiculous thing that I could ever imagine. You ask, why does Thomas Mulcair support this? Because he thinks there's, there are votes. So basically, he's not thinking about the best interests of Canadians. He's not talking at about all. the best interests of his, himself and not his party. Not at all. You know what else he would to argue? To the cost of all of us. To the cost of all of us. I think he would argue this. He would say, look, uh, in Scotland, in a year's time, they're going to have a referendum 50% plus one. Those are the rules. And it was agreed to by the central government in Britain. London agreed to the 50% plus one formula. And his argument would be, if it's good enough for one of the founding people of Canada to have such a 50% plus one referendum, why isn't it good enough for Canada? And here's my answer. Here's why. The government in London 
knows full well, a bit like Pierre Trudeau in 1980, they're going to win. They know. The polls are there. The, the, the nationalists in Scotland are going to lose. Unlike in Canada, they're not going to have a second referendum without the approval of the central government. They, it's not like in Canada, where Quebec can hold its own referendum because it's sovereign in its own jurisdiction. Ottawa cannot prevent Quebec from holding a referendum. They cannot. In, in Great Britain, they can. So the central government in Great Britain can say, I'm sorry, you had your chance, you lost, game over. We're not, come see us in 50 years, maybe we'll talk about it. That's the difference. Mulcair knows that difference, but he will never tell you that difference because he just wants nationalist votes. But going back to what we were saying before, if you know we would accept that 50 plus 1, then it, it, we could be playing yo-yo. It could go back and forth. If, if as in Canada, it's never-ending, a never-endum, as it was yeah. called. It's not that way in Great Britain. It's a one-shot deal with the, with the central government deciding if there ever is going to be a second shot. But now, let's, let's, um, let's assume that Quebec would uh, have its 50 plus 1 and they would separate. What about Montreal? Ah, what a, that's an excellent question. You know, part of the Clarity Act, which is, this is something that I blame, Chrétien is very proud of his Clarity Act, and he should be, and I say the same for Stéphane Dion, who's an ally, and Stéphane Dion did very good work in getting the Clarity Act in. But, here's my criticism. Chrétien and Dion, were a little bit two-faced about the Clarity Act. To Quebec, they would say, no, if you really want to, you can, you can leave. You just have to really, really want to. But it's not a prison. We're not keeping you in here against your will. You can leave. What they neglect to mention is that the Supreme Court said, and the Clarity Act indicates, that it co takes a constitutional amendment. You can't get a constitutional amendment just with Quebec. You've got to have at least seven provinces in the rest of Canada representing 50% of the population to agree to amend the constitution. So you can't say to Quebec, oh, you can leave if you really want to, even if they got 60%, even if. The federal government would be required to negotiate. That's the Supreme Court said. Then they would come up with some kind of deal that deal would have to be submitted to all Canadians. It would require a constitutional amendment, just like the Charlottetown Accord, if you remember, back in the 1990s. Mulroney wanted to change the Constitution. He had to go to every single province, and he needed unanimity, not even 750. So that would be exactly the same thing. And if, let's say, Alberta, let's say uh, Saskatchewan, let's say Manitoba, they say, hey, this is crazy. We, we don't like this. This is busting up our country. We're not happy. No, we won't accept it. It's off. It doesn't happen, Ricardo. I stress that because in the federal government intervention, uh, just done three weeks ago, they finally underline this part of the Supreme Court reference. It takes a constitutional amendment in order to succeed. Are right. they putting a percentage? They don't. They okay. don't. They don't. Okay. They don't, and they don't have to. Uh, but, because the, the percentage just applies to the referendum. Mm -hmm. The percentage just applies to, okay, does it trigger a negotiation with the federal government or not? The negotiation, the results of the negotiation have to be approved by other Canadians. The federal government doesn't decide. Canadians decide. Quebec doesn't decide. Canadians decide. And I want to just understand one important element here, which is such a double standard. If you look in today's paper, today, you're going to see the Quebec government in front of the Supreme Court of Canada making an argument about Canada's Senate. Because Stephen Harper did a reference about the Senate. Just what, exactly what we wanted Chrétien to do about about Jacques Parizeau's law, well, Harper's done it about the Senate, and he's asked the Senate, okay, what can I do, what, what can I not do? And the Supreme Court's listening to those arguments as we speak. And the Quebec government yesterday went in front of the 
Supreme Court and they said, you can't touch the Senate. It takes unanimity and a constitutional amendment to change the Senate. That's, That's the, what they argued. That was the PQ itself? The, the, the government of Quebec, the PQ government of Quebec. Okay, now think about it. What are they saying? They're saying, you're going to touch the Senate of Canada. It's an important institution. You have to have A, a constitutional amendment, and B, unanimity of all the provinces. That's what they argued. Well, wait a minute. You're going to change the map of Canada? That's not as important as the Senate? And you can do it all by yourself and just have a little referendum and doesn't take a constitutional amendment? And if you argue that it does, just as the Quebec lawyer argued that it did for the Senate, you're going to pass a resolution in the National Assembly condemning the federal government for arguing that? It, it's, it, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm appalled at how the double standard operates but here. Let, let's go one step further. Let's assume. Uh, first of all, I just would like to say, now, I would like to ask one more question there. Montreal, for what I understand, could stay with Canada if uh, Quebec the, was the, Yes. I, I would argue absolutely yes, and here's why. The, f the Supreme Court reference that's the highest law of our country. I don't care what Jacques Parizeau says. And he can have 10 referendums. The law is, the Constitution is bigger than the referendum. The Supreme Court has already looked at this and they said that, and I'm paraphrasing but not much, you would be dreaming if you thought Quebec could leave Canada with its present borders. That's right there in the judgment. No Which one, means if no one seriously thinks that Quebec could leave Canada with its borders intact. What about natives? How much land do they own in Quebec? A great deal. So A what if natives deal. are against it and Montreal is against it? What will they be left with? Okay, uh, the, as part of the negotiations, uh, our rights as Canadians would have to be respected. These are minority rights uh, within within. Uh, within Canada. The Aboriginal rights are also sacrosanct. They're in the Constitution, would have to be respected. The Aboriginals, people forget about it, they shouldn't. They held a referendum one day before the 1995 referendum, the Cree. They held a, ref a, a referendum of their own and they said 97%, never mind 50% plus one, 97% voted to stay in Canada. So, what does that mean? If the Clarity Act and the Supreme Court both say the borders have to be renegotiated, that means you have to respect the Cree. You have to respect uh, Canadians uh, inside. And the Quebec becomes uh, partitioned. They wanted to... Uh, it's Trudeau who said it. If Canada is divisible, so is Quebec. If they want to partition Canada into segments, then they are inviting the partitioning of Quebec. And you know something? Two years after the 1995 referendum, when we were making these arguments, the special committee were making, was we were making the arguments before the referendum. We wanted to make them during the referendum, but we were illegally prevented. And we made the arguments after the referendum. And a poll was conducted by La Presse about partition. And 60% or more of the people who responded to that poll, and you can imagine a lot of them would be French Canadians, said partition was a legitimate uh, result. It was just as legitimate as the separatist project. So yes, Montreal and other areas that were predominantly federalist could stay in Canada. And you want to know something else? Without that tax base, because 60% or more of the economic, uh, the gross provincial product is based in Montreal. It's the economic engine of the province. Without that tax base, they can't survive. They can't survive much without Canada economically anyway, because they receive plus $19 billion every year, according to the Why latest don't statistics. Why the federal government prune that more? I mean, you know, they gave us so much more than what we pay, and yet it's not coming out. Most people think the opposite. Be, I'll, I'll tell you why. And it's a, I think it's an unfortunate strategy, and I hope it changes. I think the federal government has to be a more aggressive federal government. It has opinion. to, yes, it has to stand up 
for Canada in a stronger way. And I don't mean uh, sponsorship scandals, the way Chrétien played it, you know, we're going to give 100,000 to a fishing club to hold, put a flag up in front of their podium. Mm. Uh, I mean serious pro-Canada arguments. And, you know, I'm starting to hear them. The fact that they intervened in this case is a sign that maybe they're growing a spine. I heard Jason Kenney say, uh, if you, uh, Pauline Marois and separatists, adopt this so-called uh, values charter the way it looks, we're going to take you to court. That, yes, now we're talking. And they should be out there making these arguments about uh, the, uh, the, the profitability. One of the reasons they don't, I'm speculating, there are a lot of people in Alberta and the more, the more prosperous parts of Canada who don't like handing over billions of dollars to the Quebec government when the Quebec government's a bunch of separatists and want to leave. I, listen, I understand. Uh, I fully understand. If I were in Alberta and Saskatchewan, yeah, I would well. be asking myself that question. Why are we doing this? Or I might be saying, can we put some strings on this? Why are we just handing over the money and not saying, wait a second, now, in return for this money, here's what we expect, uh, X, Y, and Z, and if you don't give us this, I'm sorry, we're not handing over the money. That's great. That, that's, that's, you know, uh, I, politics. I always thought it had a lot to do with that. They didn't want to shake up the other provinces. And then uh, Quebec says whatever they want to say, and people believe them. And we're, we're, yeah. we're fighting but amongst I, each I other. I like that string attached. Here's $500 million for health care. We should know where the money is going, not on highways or not for referendums. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You can't, uh, and that's what the Quebec government does. It takes money from the rest of Canada, and it's meant for a certain uh, purpose, and suddenly it's found in the general fund of the province of Quebec, and nobody knows what that was for. Keith, what would be the consequences of such a move if Quebec separated, let's say, for instance, our youth? If Quebec separated, um, it, you know, there's a two-part answer to this, because it's not simple. If Quebec separates, and the rest of Quebec stays in, now wait a second. I'm of two minds about that. If you said to me right today, here's your choice. We keep Quebec intact and we're ruled by Pauline Marois with all what she does. Or Montreal stays in Canada, the rest of Quebec, goodbye Charlie Brown. And uh, now we operate bilingually, we are multicultural, we're all good Canadians together, we get along with each other. Montreal would prosper better under such an arrangement than what Pauline Marois is doing. So I am uh, I'm of two minds mm -hmm. about this. It, what kind of separation? If they took everything with them and subjected us all to PQ ideology, it would be a disaster. And the young people would want to leave Montreal and go to Toronto and Vancouver even more than a lot of them already do. If it's, you know, Pauline, separatists, you, you, you have your little land, you do what you want with it, but Montreal and the rest of Quebec stays in Canada, that's another matter. You know, Keith, I always thought, if we go back years ago, if I recall correctly, like before Bill 22, the bill that was making French the language of Quebec by Robert Bourassa, our premier at the time, the separatist percentage was always between 15 and 19 percent. Yeah, you're right. And, and uh, <clears throat> the way it all happened is a lot of, uh, when the election came, Borussia was sure to watch the province, as he had done in the previous mandate, but obviously it didn't work that way. A lot of people voted against him because of that Bill 22, mm -hmm. and many voted for Union Nationale at That's that right. time. That's right. And some went, went with the PQ, and the PQ, although they had less vote, became the official party of Quebec and they were really not ready at the time. Mm -hmm. And then 300,000 people left this beautiful province and no time at all. They call that Révolution Tranquille. Yeah. Now, the, the, the facts of the matter is like for these other provinces, in uh, perhaps they should understand that 
it's not a majority of Quebecers that really want to have independence. There's been manipulation of a system from the beginning. You know, like at that time, plus, like I said before, some Federalists were of Quebec were really trying to do everything so that we would win with 1% so that the rest of Canada would be at our knees. I was totally against that kind of principle. Well, you know, so you, you put your finger on an important element of the separatist project. I think there are a lot of separatists who, if push comes to shove, they don't really want to separate, but they want to be able to have the weapon because they want to be able to scare and blackmail and extort. Exactly. And they say, if we have this weapon, we can, we can threaten yeah. and they have to do this or that. I think there are a lot of strategic separatists out yeah. there. And let's face it, the federal government has spent a lot of time giving in and saying, okay, well, we better appease you. <laughs> All right, we, you know, maybe you'll go away and be happy, and they give them this, they give them that. I think in a lot of the rest of Canada, there's a, not an appetite for, for that anymore. And there's resentment. Absolutely. There's resentment. Uh, yeah. We're not going to be blackmailed. We're, we're fed up of handing over millions upon millions if not billions of dollars to separatists and others who couldn't care less about uh, Canada and we're just we're, we're, we'd like to put a stop to that if when when the reaction sets in separatists say oh we love that we love that uh, I would say to them be careful because the days of strategic separation nationalism we're going to extort money out of the rest of Canada I think they're over so <clears throat> Where do we stand today? We stand, you know, it's a, it, that's a very good question. And that's a very good question. Where do we stand today? Here's where I hope we stand today. I hope the, uh, and this leaves aside Thomas Mulcair, because Mulcair is the old school. We give in, uh, we play along with nationalism, and we provide money for Quebec nationalists, no strings attached. That's the old school. Those are the old days. I hope they're dead. Hmm? Maybe in Quebec, but the rest of Canada, I hope, finished with that. So we're left with Harper and Justin Trudeau. Trudeau's enough of his father's son not to want to play those games. I believe that. I think he's a strong Canadian, despite some silly things he might have said. Oh, if this is Harper's Canada, I'm going to become a separatist. Uh, he says silly things from time to time, Justin yeah. does, but I think his heart is, as his father's was, is with, with Canada. I think he's a Federalist and a strong Canadian. So if he comes to power, I'm, I'm not worried that the Clarity Act is suddenly going to be taken away. Uh, Harper, I think, and this is what I'm hoping, and I hope it for both those truly Federalist parties. The NDP I don't even consider a Federalist party. Those two Federalist parties, I hope they're saying, um, we want a stronger uh, pro-Canadian response to the challenge of separatist governments in Quebec. Uh, so if they do something like a, a values charter, we're going to be out there so fast. Justin Trudeau was, to give him credit. He was very strong in his opposition to that values charter. But so is Stephen Harper and Jason Kenney. We're going to take them to court. That's what we in the special committee did from 15 years ago. Okay, but what if we end up with somebody that may be more of a separatist, but he is the leader of the federal liberals? What danger would we run at that time? Uh, it's danger. We've got somebody who's ready to play ball already as the, official, uh, the leader of the official opposition. We have Thomas Mulcair. Yeah. Uh, so he's already playing that How game. can we stop that? Is there a way to make it that from now on we're going to turn the page and grow up and uh, really uh, you know, live with harmony? And you know, oh, it's a good question. I'm not sure that there's anything we can do politically to stop it except to, to, to become involved. Uh, to, that's politically. But here's, here's something we tend to forget. Politics is important, the legislature is important, votes in the legislature are important. But we're not governed just by a uh, prime minister's office or, or by, uh, by parliament. We're governed by 
the Supreme Court, the judiciary. It's an equal pillar of government in our democracy. And they are the ones who have ruled on the separatists. They have said, no, your project is illegal. Here are the rules. They set them down, the Supreme Court. And my feeling is, if ever in Quebec, more in Quebec, were threatened by separatists, take them to court. That's the answer. Get them into court so fast. Use all your allies. If the federal government's going to join in with you, great. If it takes uh, individual lawyers working pro bono, great. Take them to court and they'll soon learn, no, you can't do that. Keith, uh, uh, a lot of people that were looking for independence, some were scared of losing their, their language. Yeah. Some really believe that we were abused by the English. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I look at Quebec today. I'm a proud Quebecer, but over and above that, I'm a proud Canadian. When you send your kids to French school, there's only the Quebec flag. Shouldn't the Federalists step in there and all schools throughout Canada should have the Canadian flag? I'm just saying that, but then going one step further. Well, well let me intervene. What could. Ahead. Education's a provincial responsibility. Yeah. That's what the nationalists would argue. Ottawa, you stay out of this, yeah. you have nothing to say. So you can't come in here and tell us what flag to put up. Yeah. Mm, wait a second. Ottawa gives, as transfer payments, millions upon millions upon millions of dollars for education. for education. So Ottawa says, strings attached, you want that money? You put a Canadian flag up in your schools too. Well, about, you don't, you don't, you don't get the money. It's about time they put their pants up. Okay. Now I'm going to go one step further. But if all schools of Quebec were bilingualism, most French people wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, you're so right. You know, I have, I'm lucky, I'm lucky my wife and I get to, to go over to Europe. We were there a couple of times this year. We were in Paris. Okay. We were also in Germany. Let me tell you my story about Paris. We were in a Parisian restaurant. Remember, this is the European economic community now. Yeah. It's not just France. It's all of Europe. It's all of Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would argue that in many ways, their borders are more open between countries than our provincial borders are. I would argue that. You go to Paris and you can go to a restaurant and there will be a young lady from Germany and she'll be serving everybody in français, eh? that's Paris. And then she hears a, an accent and suddenly she switches to English, very good English. And she hears somebody comes from Germany and she switches into German. So she's trialing you all. She comes to a table and there, this is Paris, it's a world city, there's a, a girl from Norway and her boyfriend are sitting there. And she opens up in French and then the girl says to her in English, um, my boyfriend, he, he speaks only Norwegian, he doesn't speak any French, so could we speak in English? And the waitress immediately speaks in English. This is Paris. Nobody says, hey, écoute, oh, c'est en français ici à Paris, hein? Excusez-moi. Nobody says that. Hey, it's stop signs, stop signs. Uh, no yes, no, it's all yeah. open. It's, yeah. it's the world is there and We're, they welcome it. We've been manipulated by a minority of people in Quebec for years that have been dictating the, the, the rules and the way I see it, the Federalists never really put their pants up and say, hey, this is how it is, just like you were saying. They, and you know, what they hear, what they say is, Mais écoute, hein, au Québec c'est petit, hein? c'est un petit pays au centre de mer d'anglophones. Mm. And they're going to lose their language. C'est ça. Mais, but mais, if all schools are bilingual. But in Norway, mm. it's also probably even smaller than Quebec. Uh, Denmark is smaller, and if you go to Norway, they speak wonderful English. Nobody says, oh, we're going to lose our Norwegian. They, it, it, they don't That's have these paranoias. Tactic. 
in Germany, yeah. in Germany, a big country, they don't have to worry about, okay, they have 90 million Germans, they, 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 they have a large country, they teach their kids English from grade one. It's a required second language from grade one. You go to Germany, I was amazed. You can speak to bus drivers, you can speak to, to, and they all, if they sense your English, they can respond in excellent English. I got uh, stopped on a, in a little town by three, they might, couldn't have been more than 12. They were sitting on a park bench, mm -hmm. talking to each other in German, the way kids do. And they looked at me and they thought, okay, he looks like a grandfather. And so they asked me in German what the time was. I didn't know what yeah. this was, what they asked. So I said, uh, and I spoke in the Deutsch. And they immediately shifted into English, these 12-year-old kids, and asked me in English, what is the time, and carried on a conversation. This is beauty, respect. Come on, it's incredible. And it isn't <coughs> just, they, they don't just speak English. They, they, these kids want to learn Italian, they want to learn yeah. French. Keith. If you had one thing to say, in conclusion about all of this, what would it be? Canada is a wonderful country, Ricardo. It's a fabulous place. When I travel around, I come back to Canada and I see the space and the housing and the streets. It's, it's, it's a fantastic place. But we have been misled over these decades by, and it's ironic because these old ideas about, you know, protect yourself, la langue française, ça doit être protégé, those are European ideas from 50 to 100 years ago. Those are old nationalist things. And so many Europeans left Europe to get away from that, to come here because they thought it was free and open and they could teach their kids, you know, Italian and English and French. And we've been, we're getting misled. We're going down the wrong path. It's the old European path of ethnic nationalism. And what I hope to see for the future is that we start, our politicians start going to Europe, ironically, and learning what they're doing. That's what Canada should be. It's amazing. Eh? Those people that want to promote unilingual French, like Parizeau and many others, have sent their kids in English school or bilingual school? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Isn't that interesting? Oh, yes. That's the, you know, it's okay for me to have openness mm -hmm. because I'm part of the elite. But you in Shikutsimi, no, 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 c'est pas acceptable. That's what they do. It's like, it's like, I'm, I'm the priest, so I'm allowed. Yeah. But you, you can't. Yeah, so there obviously are a lot of... Uh, priorities for their own personal needs instead of really the citizens' needs. Yes, and it's the old elite, you know? Yeah. We're part of the political elite, and so we have special privileges, and you don't. I, I'm going to finish with that, but I find it horrible that someone that went to parents that are French, you know, Canadians, but a French uh, ascendant, uh, cannot send their kids where they could have the opportunities and the privilege of learning two languages. They are forbidden. This is dictation. It, it's an outrage. It's yeah. an outrage. And it's so completely stupid because that's one of the advantages that Canada has. Mm. It has this, these two major European languages. And instead of asking for people to uh, open this, we close, we set rules, we put up walls. It's nuts. Okay. I thank you very much. Thank you to uh, sensitize us of what the Clarity Act is all about and, you know, let us keep fighting for a great country, unity. Thanks for having me, Ricardo. Thank you so much.